did say we need to adopt the standard, but what was left out was what came afterwards. What Morris said is that, that we need to protect against bribery because we don't want anything like what happened with Louis XIV and Charles II. That is, the example he gave of bribery was accepting actual money as the head of state. So what had happened in that example that Morris gave as his example of bribery was that Louis XIV, who was a bit of a recidivist when it came to bribes, uh, gave Charles II a huge amount of money, as well as other benefits, including apparently a, a French mistress, in exchange for uh, the secret treaty of Dover of 1670. Uh, it also was an exchange for his converting to Catholicism. But that wasn't some broad notion of bribery. It was actually quite narrow. So I don't think that dog will hunt in the 18th century, and I don't think it'll hunt today. Because if you take a look at the 21st century, bribery is well defined. And you shouldn't just take our word for it. You should look to how it's defined by the United States Supreme Court. In a case called McDonnell versus the United States, the Supreme Court looked at a public corruption bribery case. This was a case where gifts were actually received. Benefits were actually extended. There was completion. Okay, this was not some hypothetical of, of a, a crime that was not fulfilled or an action that was not actually taken. The Supreme Court unanimously overturned that conviction unanimously. And what they said was that you cannot take the bribery crime um, and use what they called a boundless interpretation. All the justices said that it's a dangerous thing to take a crime like bribery and apply a boundless interpretation. They rejected the notion, for example, that bribery could be used in terms of setting up meetings and other types of things that occur in the course of uh, a public service career. Uh, so what I would caution the committee is that these crimes have meaning. It gives me no joy to disagree with my colleagues here. And I really don't have a dog in this fight. But you can't accuse a president of bribery. And then when some of us note that the Supreme Court has rejected your type of boundless interpretation, say, well, it's just impeachment. We really don't have to prove the elements. That's a favorite mantra that is sort of close enough for jazz. Well, this isn't improv improvisational jazz. Close enough is not good enough. If you're going to accuse a president of bribery, you need to make it stick because you're trying to remove a duly elected president of the United States. Now, it's unfair to accuse someone of a crime and when others say, well, those interpretations you're using to define the crime are not valid and to say they don't have to be valid because this is impeachment. That has not been the standard historically. If you, my testimony lays out the criminal allegations in the previous impeachments. Those were not just proven crimes, they were accepted crimes. That is, even the Democrats on that judiciary, that the Judiciary Committee agreed that Bill Clinton had committed perjury. That's on the record, and, there, and a federal judge later said it was perjury. In the case of Nixon, the crimes were established. No one seriously disagreed with those crimes. Now, Johnson's the outlier because Johnson was a trapdoor crime. They basically created a crime knowing that Johnson wanted to replace Secretary of War Stanton. And Johnson did because they had serious trouble in the cabinet. So they created a trapdoor crime, waited for him to fire the Secretary of War, and then they impeached him. But there's no question he committed the crime, it's just the underlying statute was unconstitutional. So I would caution you not only about bribery, but also obstruction. I'm sorry, Ranking Member, you? No, you're doing a good job, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I'd also caution you about obstruction. Obstruction is a crime also with meaning. It has elements 
It has controlling case authority. The record does not establish obstruction in this case. That is, what my esteemed colleague said was certainly true. If you accept all of their presumptions, it would be obstruction. But impeachments have to be based on proof, not presumptions. That's the problem when you move towards impeachment on this abbreviated schedule that has not been explained to me. Why you want to set the record for the fastest impeachment. Fast is not good for impeachment. Narrow, fast impeachments have failed. Just ask Johnson. So the obstruction issue is an example of this problem. And here's my concern. The theory being put forward is that President Trump obstructed Congress by not turning over material requested by the committee. Okay? And citations have been made to the third article of the Nixon impeachment. Now, first of all, I want to confess, I've been a critic of the third article of the Nixon impeachment my whole life. My hair catches on fire every time someone mentions the third article. Why? Because you would be replicating one of the worst articles written on impeachment. Here's the reason why. Peter Rodino's position as chairman of judiciary was that Congress alone decides what information may be given to it, alone. His position was that the courts have no role in this. And so, if any, by that theory, any refusal by a president based on executive privilege or immunities would be the basis of impeachment. That is essentially the theory that's being replicated today. President Trump has gone to, Congre to, to the courts. He's allowed to do that. We have three branches, not two. I happen to agree with some of your criticism about President Trump, including that earlier quote where my colleagues talked about his saying that I, there's this article too, and he gives this overriding interpretation. I share that criticism. You're doing the same thing with Article 1. You're saying Article 1 gives us complete authority that when we demand information from another branch, it must be turned over or we'll impeach you in record time. Now, making that worse is that you have such a short investigation. It's a perfect storm. You set an incredibly short period, demand a huge amount of information, and when the president goes to court, you then impeach him. Now, does that track with what you've heard about impeachment? Does that track with the rule of law that we talked about? So, on obstruction, I would encourage you to think about this. In Nixon, it did go to the courts, and Nixon lost. And that was the reason Nixon resigned. He resigned a few days after the Supreme Court ruled against him in that critical case. But in that case, the court recognized there are executive privilege arguments that can be made. It didn't say, you had no right coming to us, don't darken our doorstep again. It said, we've heard your arguments, we've heard Congress's arguments, and you know what? You lose. Turn over the material to Congress. Do you know that, what that did for the judiciary is it gave this body legitimacy. It wasn't the Rodino extreme position that only you decide what information can be produced. Now, recently, there are some rulings against President Trump, including a ruling involving Don McGahn. Mr. Chairman, I testified in front of you a few months ago, and if you recall, we had an exchange, and I encouraged you to bring those actions. And I said I thought you would win, and you did. And I think it's an, it was an important win for this committee because I don't agree with President Trump's argument in that case. But that's an example of what can happen if you actually subpoena witnesses and go to court. Then you have an obstruction case because a court issues an order. And unless they stay that order by a higher court, you have obstruction. But. I can't emphasize this enough, and I'll say it just one more time. If you impeach a president, if you make a high crime and misdemeanor out of going to the courts, it is an abuse of power. It's your abuse of power.
you're doing precisely what you're criticizing the president for doing. We have a third branch that deals with conflicts of the other two branches. And what comes out of there and what you do with it is the very definition of legitimacy. Let's continue on. Let's unpack what you've been talking about. First of all, the McDonald case, how was that decided? Was that a very split court? Were they really uh, torn about that? That case came out how? Yeah, it, it came out unanimous. So did a couple of the other cases I cite in my testimony, which also refute these criminal theories. One of the things that you tend to, that you said also, and I think it would be, could be summed up, and I use it sometimes, just what's the layman's language here, is facts don't matter. And that's what I heard a lot of in the 45 minutes. Well, the facts said this, or the facts are disputed this, but if this, if that, if this, it rises to an impeachment level. And that was sort of what you're saying, that crimes, I, I think your word was, crimes have meanings. And I think this is the concern that I have. Um, is there a concern that if we just say it up that facts don't matter, that we're also, as you've said, abusing our power as we go forward here and actually looking at what uh, people would actually deem as an impeachable offense? I think so. And part of the problem is that to bring a couple of these articles, you have to contradict the position of President Obama. Uh, President Obama withheld evidence from Congress in Fast and Furious, an investigation, a rather moronic program, that led to the death of a federal agent. President Obama gave a sweeping argument that he was not only not going to give evidence to this body, but that a court had absolutely no role in determining whether he could withhold the evidence. Mr. Mr. I have a question on that. Because you brought up Mr. Obama, you brought up other presidents in this process. Is there not an obligation by the office of the president? We'll just use that term not to be Obama, Trump, Clinton, anybody. Isn't there an obligation by the president to actually assert the constitutional privileges or authorities that have been given uh, or when accused of something or crime or anything else? Yeah, I, I think that President Obama has invoked too broadly. But on the other hand, he has actually released a lot of information um, you know, I've, I've been friends with Bill Barr for a long time. Uh, we disagree on uh, executive privilege. I'm a Madisonian scholar. I tend to favor Congress in disputes. Uh, and he is the inverse. His natural default is Article 2. My natural default is Article 1. But he actually has released more privileged information than any attorney general in my lifetime, including the Mueller report. These transcripts of these calls would be core executive privilege material. There's no question about that. This, and I think that's something that's, again, not pointed out when you're doing a, a back and forth like we're doing. The, the transcript of the call released, the things that have been released from Mueller, as we go back through this, there has been, you know, uh, work in progress by this administration. I think the interesting point that I want to talk about is two things. Number one, Congress's abuse of its own power, which has not been discussed here, even internally, where we have had committees not willing to let members see uh, transcripts, not being willing to give those up under the guise of, of impeachment or you shouldn't be able to see them, although the rules of the House were never invoked to stop that. What we're seeing here, and I want to hit something else before we move on to something else, is the timing issue that you've talked about here. Again, I, I believe we talked about this with the Mueller report. We talked about this with everything else. This is one of the fastest, you know, you know we're on a train. I said this earlier. We're on a, a clock. The clock and the calendar are seemingly dominating this is irregardless of what anybody on this committee, and especially members not of this committee, to think about what we're actually seeing of fact witnesses and people moving forward. We don't have that yet. So the question becomes, is an election pending when facts are in dispute, and you may have mentioned this, this is one in which the facts are not unanimous. There's not universal, there's not even bipartisan agreement on the facts and what, they're, uh, what they lead to, especially when there's exculpatory evidence that has been presented, not in a shift report, but in other reports. Does that timing bother you from a historical perspective, not only in the past, but moving forward as well? Yeah, fast and narrow is not a good recipe for impeachment. That's the case with Johnson. Narrow was the case with Clinton. They tend not to survive. They tend to collapse in front of the Senate. Impeachments are like buildings. There's a ratio between your foundation and your height. And this is the highest structure you can build under the Constitution. You want to build an impeachment? You have to have a foundation broad enough to support it. This is the narrowest impeachment in history. You could argue with Johnson. Uh, Johnson might actually be the fastest impeachment. Johnson actually 
actually was, the, the, what happened to Johnson was actually the fourth impeachment attempt against Johnson. And actually the, the record goes back a year before. They laid that trap door a year before. So it was not as fast as it made it out, to see, it, it might appear. Let me, and again, let's go back, to, I wanna go back to something else. And you talked about bribery and I'm uh, uh, Mr. Taylor's gonna address a good bit of that, but I wanna go back to something that you talked about because it really bothers, I think, the, the perception out there of what's going on here in the disputed uh, transcript, being that you know the call has been laid out there, the president said I wanted nothing for this. There's all this exculpatory evidence that was not presented in the last 45 minutes. But there is one thing that's interesting, is and it's been reported in the mainstream media, and it goes back to your issue of does crimes matter or, does, or what this definition is, is that House, uh, our majority initially accused the president, and they kept saying quid pro quo, and we still hear it as we go through. But then, as reported, they used a political focus group to determine whether the phrase polled well. And apparently it didn't poll well, so they agreed to change their theory of the case to bribery. Does that not just feed into more of what you're saying about how we're actually, the crime matters and that facts do matter in a case like it, or at least should matter? It does. There's a reason why every past impeachment has established crimes. And it's obvious. It's not that you can't impeach on a non-crime. You, you can. And in fact, non-crimes have been part of past impeachments. It's just that they've never never gone up alone or primarily in, as the basis of impeachment. That's the problem here. If you prove a quid pro quo, that you, you might have an impeachable offense. But to go up only on a non-criminal case would be the first time in history. So why is that the case? The reason is that crimes have an established definition and case law. So there's a concrete, independent body of law that assures the public that this is not just political, that this is a president who did something they could not do. You can't say the president is above the law if you then say the crimes you accuse him of really don't have to be established. I think that's the problem right now that many members of this House, members of this body, and especially the American public are looking at that if you say he's above the law, but then you don't define it or you define the facts to whatever you want to have, that is the ultimate railroad that everybody in this country should not be afforded. Everyone is afforded due process. Everyone is afforded the process to actually make their case heard. That's the concern that I have in this committee right now. And we've already seen it voted down that we're not going to look at certain fact witnesses. We're not even been promised other hearings in which this committee, and in the words in the concern concerns that echoed almost 20 years ago from the chairman where he was did not want to take the advice of another body or entity giving us the Judiciary Committee a report and then acting as a rubber stamp if we didn't do this. Just as a reminder, it was almost two and a half weeks before the discussion of this kind of a hearing back then before the hearing actually took place. These are the kind of things that as timing goes, I think the, the, the obvious point here is that timing is becoming more of the issue because, they're because of the concern has been stated before about elections. They're more concerned about trying to fit the facts in to what the president supposedly did, presumably did, and make those hypotheticals stick to the American public. The problem is their timing, the definition of crimes, the definition of the fact that bribery as defined by the Supreme Court is not making their case. It's not fitting what they need to do. The issue that we have to deal with going forward forward is, why the rush? Why do we still not have the information from the uh, Intelligence Committee? Why is the IC Inspector General's report from the IC Committee being withheld, even in a non-class, in a classified setting? These are the problems that you have now highlighted.